All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Onward Productions, and welcome to this wonderful Valentine's Day edition of our Sunday Fireside. We've got Dr. David Morgan. We've got Annalyn Condi. How are you two? We're excited to be here. Wonderful. Great to be here. Well, happy Valentine's Day. And for Thank some you. of you, happy Valentine's Day. Because <laughs> I, did the, I did the Valentine's nail polish for this <laughs> event. Good. Well, I'm. you know what? Then I'm really, I almost did the same nail polish. Like I know, I, was I know. Close, and I then know. I didn't, so. And, and I thought we might need to coordinate lipstick color, but it looks like we did fine on that yeah. too. <laughs> I went with the nude shade today. I, I, yeah. I, I think that's good. Neutral. Yeah, and I feel like I'm like all pink. I don't know, like I'm some kind of one of the heart candies. I don't know what's going well, on. Well, you if you are a heart candy, then I think the expression would be you're awesome. I think because you are, or you're stale because you're fifty. <laughs> Which is probably why, if you're thinking that you're pink, it's probably because you were just in Florida celebrating I your was. 50th, weren't you? Yes, it was wonderful. It was what I wished for. I wanted a warm day and I wanted time with my family, and we got both. So oh, it was, that's it was awesome. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Good for you. Well, I'm so glad that you made it back safe and sound and that we get to be here with everybody tonight on Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. By the way, this fireside, thank you to Onward Productions as always for letting us come and do this wonderful fireside. This so tonight we are going to go a little bit shorter than we usually go just because we want you to be able to get to your spouse and to your family or to your cat or your dog or whatever you're doing whoever you're celebrating with we want you to have time with them tonight because it is valentine's day and so thank you for joining us and let me just say if you're watching this we love you and happy valentine's day to you tonight we are going to be talking about relationships and we have two relationship experts uh which is to counter my total failure in relationships so we've got dr david morgan who obviously knows some things that he could share with you and Gaina Lynn Condi, who's just amazing every time she opens her mouth and then the bald guy. And so I'm excited to be here to host with you and, uh, and excited to be able to kick things off tonight. Now, by the way, if you're watching live, make sure you go and drop something in the, in the comments, uh, and let us know where you're watching from. It's so nice to be able to come together this global audience on Valentine's day to, to talk about things that matter and to, uh, to enjoy some time together and to be able to fill the spirit together. And in that spirit, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off with an opening prayer. And then we are going to welcome on Dr. David Morgan. Um, and we are going to have a lot of fun tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and start with a prayer. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we're able to be gathered here uh, for this wonderful fireside. We're so thankful for Shane and Mandy and for Onward Productions and thankful for this amazing global audience that is able to join us and be able to be here to be able to talk about things that are important. Father, we're thankful for this Valentine's Day. We love thee. We love the Savior. We pray that as we um, connect tonight uh, virtually, that we can feel thy love and feel the love of the Savior and that we can think of um, the many reasons we have to love thee and to love those in our family and those who are close to us. We pray that we can have thy spirit to be with us, that thou please bless Dr. Morgan and Gainal and Condi as they share things that thou hast inspired them to share. We pray that thy spirit may be present and that all those watching may be positively impacted as we talk about this important topic of relationships tonight. We thank thee for this gospel. We thank thee for thy son. And we say these things in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right. Well, we are ready to get things kicked off. And so, Dr. Morgan, over to you, my friend. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone, uh, for tuning in tonight. Uh, like Kevin said, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I hope you've had a, a great Sunday already and that this is just the, the cherry on the top of your, of your great day. Um, so let's talk a little bit about relationships tonight. Um, you know, as in my work as a psychologist, I was just reflecting on this as I've been preparing for this uh, fireside. Uh, relationships are like the, the greatest source of our happiness and also sometimes the greatest source of our distress. Um, people that I work with in counseling, in almost every case, the things that, you know, that they're struggling with are almost always connected to relationships. 
And um, it, it reminds me, we were, uh, uh, Gaina Lynn, uh, as we talked about earlier, she went to Florida for her um, 50th birthday. And, and I know that she went to the Magic Kingdom uh, at Walt Disney World. And I think about uh, relationships as like a roller coaster, you know, in, in order to have the, the extremes, there has to be highs and there has to be lows in order for it to be intense. If it was just this kind of little roller coaster that, you know, just barely had any ups and downs, that'd be fine. It wouldn't be very uh, dangerous, but it wouldn't be very intense either. And that's kind of the thing about relationships is that they can be a great source of happiness, but also cause us some difficulty. So I want to talk tonight about how to increase the happiness in our relationships, how to um, increase the, the connectedness in those. And, and I'm talking about any sort of significant relationship you have, not just a marriage relationship. I'm talking about a family relationship like with a sibling or with a parent, or if it is with a significant other or with a very close friend or something like that, what we can do in order to deepen those relationships and to make them more fulfilling over time. Uh, it takes work to do that. Um, it doesn't just happen automatically. There are things that we need to do in order to make that happen. Um, and, and really what it comes down to is this concept of emotional intimacy. Uh, and that refers to the degree to which we are kind of connected and bonded to another person. Um, it, it's the opposite of a superficial relationship. Uh, so for example, when uh, so almost 30 years ago, well, actually 30 years ago now, when my wife and I were dating, um, we, boy, we thought we had, we thought we had so much in common because um, I think our favorite colors were the same and we both wanted to have six kids and, and even our favorite ice creams were the same and stuff like that. Well, that's great, but, but truly our relationship at that time was pretty superficial. Um, we loved each other, but, but there wasn't a lot of depth to that relationship. Now, 30 years later, there's a much greater depth to that relationship, but it's taken time. And that process of deepening is called, is, is emotional intimacy. And it's gotta be intentional. So one of the reasons that relationships either get stuck in that superficial stage, or maybe they are deep and then they back out if, from that superficial to another superficial stage is because we get hurt. Um, we get in these relationships and we kind of let people into like the inner sanctums of our hearts. And then if we get um, betrayed or abused or mistreated or something like that, then we think, well, that's for the birds. I don't want someone to do that again. So we build these very strong fortresses um, around, our, around our hearts, around our um, kind of our emotions. And in some ways, I think that's not a bad idea. We need to protect ourselves. You don't need to walk out there just completely vulnerable, um, you know, getting you know getting emotionally hurt by everyone. But the problem is sometimes those walls are so strong that we never let anyone in. So I like to view, I think, like a healthy uh, emotional boundary would be like a like a castle or something that has very fortified walls, but that has like like four drawbridges. So places of entrance where the person inside can lower the drawbridge and invite someone in and they can come in and be with them. Um, that, that's the way it needs to be. If it's just all brick with no doors, that's no good. Um, and so if, if you find yourself in a relationship where you feel like you are not very close to someone or you feel like you don't want them to get close to you because you are, you know, because you're afraid of getting hurt, we're going to talk today about the process of kind of creating those openings. Um, creating those uh, those drawbridges so that that you control, you get to open and close them. You decide who comes in and who doesn't come in, but it gives you the option of letting people in. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about three ways tonight that I think that we can deepen and kind of uh, improve the overall quality of our significant relationships, and they all have to do with love, which is uh, great considering it's Valentine's Day. Um, so my first suggestion is to love first. That's my first suggestion, love first. And I want to read a scripture to you in 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. Uh, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath made torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. That's the one I want to focus on, verse 19. 
We love him because he first loved us. And it's talking about the Savior. Um, and, and that makes sense, right? He, the Savior has set the example. He's saying, I love you. I care for you. Now I want you to love me back. Um, sometimes we get stuck in these like emotional stalemates where, uh, you know, if you've got two people and, and view the castles surrounded by the, you know, the, the stone walls and neither of them have open drawbridges, who's going to make the first move, right? Who's going to open their drawbridge and say, hey, come in here, be with me, get close to me where I'm vulnerable, where I'm, you know, open to, to be hurt, but I trust you that you won't do that. Um, when, when you get stuck in those stalemates, then, and if no one makes the first move, then nothing happens and that relationship doesn't deepen. So that's my advice to you is to be the first person to make that move, extend that love first to that other person. Um, that's a risk on your part. I totally get and understand that. And obviously we want to kind of vet the type of people that we're going to open our drawbridge for. We don't want to open it for anyone. So, you know, you'll be thinking about a relationship and thinking, you know, maybe it is time for us to get a little closer, get a little more emotionally bonded. And, and by you opening up and letting them come in, that's a signal for them to do the same to you. Um, I have a great example of this uh, many years ago. Uh, one of my brothers, who I love uh, dearly, he was going through a really uh, terrible time in life. And he was in a lot of distress. And uh, he started calling me fairly frequently, which I loved. And so he would call and he would talk and, and we'd you know, talk about what was going on. And um, sometimes he'd ask for counsel. Sometimes he just needed a listening ear. And at the end of every conversation, he would say, um, hey, Dave, I love you. And that was something that in my family growing up, we, we loved each other deeply, but we didn't say I love you very much. Uh, it was just, you know, we didn't say that. And so when Mike started saying that to me, oh, I just said his name. Hi, Mike. <laughs> he knows who he is. Um, he, uh, when he said that to me, of course, I told him I loved him back. I said, hey, I love you too. And, and at every conversation, we ended it that way. I love you. I love you too. And it became easier for me to say that over time and much more comfortable. I felt it for decades towards him, but I had just not developed the comfort in saying it. And because he made that overture, because he said it first, it made it easier for me to say it. And now I love saying it to all my siblings and my in-laws. And, and that's just how I end the conversations is just, I love you. And they usually say, I love you back. And it's just, it's great. And I, and I feel that way towards them. But it took someone to take that first step and to make that first move. In this case, it was my brother, um, which I think was great. Um, and, and so for you, that's the step you need to take. And if it's I love you, or if it's not that type of a relationship, it's I truly appreciate you, or you mean a lot to me, or whatever it is, um, the, the feeling behind the phrase is much more important than the words themselves. People can say I love you all the time and with no meaning behind it, and it doesn't mean anything. So it's not about the words. It's about the words plus the feeling. Um, so if you are willing to take that first step and to express those feelings of affection for that other person, that person you want to get closer to, that opens the door for them to reciprocate and do the same to you. So that's the first uh, idea is to love first. Number two is to love often, okay? Um, to not be stingy with our love. Uh, let me read another scripture to you. Uh, this is... Well, it's verse 18. I'm pretty sure this is Helaman chapter 16. No, no, I'm sorry. 35 chapter 10 um, or chapter 8. <laughs> You're thinking I'm a crazy man. Look it up. I'm pretty sure this is... Um, this is chapter 10, 35, chapter 10, verse 18. And it came to pass that in the ending of the 30th and fourth year, behold, I will show unto you that the people of Nephi who were spared, and also all those who had been called Lamanites who had been spared, did have great favors shown unto them, and great blessings poured out upon their heads, insomuch that soon after the ascension of Christ into heaven, he did truly manifest himself unto them. Where the verse is located is inconsequential. What I wanted to point out was this idea of the Lord pouring out blessings upon their head. I love that verb. Um, it doesn't say that he sprinkled blessings upon their head or he dripped blessings upon their head or, or slowly labeled blessings upon their head. He poured out blessings upon their head. I, I, it reminds me of um, going to this water park um, one time and there was this, in this like little play, water play area, there's this big giant bucket 
had to been, you know, a thousand gallons and it would slowly, slowly, slowly fill. And then, and then it would tip ever so slightly. And then when it got enough water in it, it would dump out and these thousands of gallons would come pouring out and anyone who happened to be standing there would get completely drenched. That's how I feel the Lord is with his blessings with us. It's just this effusive outpouring of love and blessings. And so when we are expressing our love to other people, um, I like that idea. And I'm not suggesting it needs to be, you know, a thousand gallons at a time, but if we're being stingy about that, if we're withholding our love or, or being very selective about when we say it or how we say it, um, I think that makes a difference in relationships. I think if you um, express some affection to those that you love and care about every single day, even multiple times a day, I think that makes a huge difference. Um, if you can't remember the last time you said I love you to someone that you truly care about, then I'd suggest there's some good room for change in there. Um, and you might say, well, it makes me uncomfortable. I totally get it. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. You know what's going to make it more comfortable? Saying it. Saying it over and over and over again. And then pretty soon it'll be uh, it'll be commonplace. Not that it won't have meaning, but it'll just be much, much easier to say. Um, I think it's important to say it, and I think it's also important to show it as well in our affection. And that's when you often hear people talk about kind of uh, love languages. Um, I, I sometimes call it emotional currency. It's different for every single one of us. Um, some people, uh, some people, their emotional currency is you bring them a bouquet of flowers, and they're like, "Wow, that was great." I can tell you, with my wife, she loves a bouquet of flowers. That's great, but you know what she really loves? She loves a back rub and she would take a back rub from me seven days a week over a, um, over a bouquet of roses. Other people want the bouquet of roses. Other people maybe want you to just listen to them for an hour. Um, and maybe that's their, their love language or their emotional currency. So when we're showing other people how we care about them, we need to make sure that we communicate in their language or pay them with their currency. If, if my currency is flowers and my wife's currency is back rubs and I keep paying her in flowers, you know, it's okay, but she's not going to feel that, um, feel it as, as keenly or as deeply as if I pay her in the way that she, that she would like that. And then we get to know people over time. We get to know what they like and what they appreciate. Um, and, and we could, we could ask them even, you could just say, Hey, I'd love to express my affection to you. What would it, you know, what would you like? You know, for me, I like to go out to eat. And so if someone gave me a gift card to go somewhere, fantastic. I would love that. Other people, maybe they don't like to eat out at all. And so you give them a gift card and they're like, yeah, you know, it doesn't really mean much to them. Um, but if you send them a handwritten note, maybe that's their thing and that's what they really like. So, so when you express that affection towards other people, two things, make sure you do it frequently and make sure you do it in their in their currency in their language um, sometimes and, and i hear this often in uh in established relationships oftentimes marriages and um and sorry brethren but it's oftentimes the husbands i hear saying this and they'll say well i, I don't need to tell my wife i love her because she should know that by what i do i i work every day blah 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 and i, I think that's a weak excuse um, we need to say it. We need to say it and people want to hear it. So this idea of they should just know, um, I don't like that because that takes the burden off us. We need to act. We need to take responsibility and do the things that, that we've been commanded to do. So in that case, that means that we need to express our affection towards other people. Um, and if those verbal expressions of affection are not backed up by the action, then it's just, uh, you know, hollow and hollow anyway, right? Um, if it's, I love you, but I never do anything to show you I love you, then that's no good. And if I show you I love you, but I never tell you I love you, that's less as well. Combination of both. Say it and show it and do it frequently. So that's the, that's the second uh, piece there is to love often. And the third one is to love regardless. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so when the Savior met with his apostles, and I actually have the book and chapter on this one, uh, John 13, 34, this is in the Last Supper. A new commandment I give unto you, that you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Very famous scripture, very quotable. Um, 
I have thought about that scripture for a long time. And when I first uh, started thinking deeply about it, I thought, well, how is that a new commandment? Loving one another, that, that didn't seem like that wasn't very new. Did some research and I find all the way back in Old Testament times with Moses. In the law of Moses, there's a commandment to love one another. So I thought, well, how is this new? Well, it's you have to kind of get into the details there. That you love one another as I have loved you. That's the difference. The commandment back in Leviticus just says, love one another. The commandment in John says, love one another as I have loved you. So it had to, that commandment had to wait because Jesus had to show them how he loved them. For three and a half years, he had spent giving him his, giving them his example and showing them how to love. And so then he could say, hey, here's a new commandment. Don't just love one another, love one another the way that I love people and as I have manifest my, by my example. Um, so how does the Savior love us? One of the greatest qualities of his love, uh, probably the, one of the best, is that he loves us regardless of what we do. He loves us regardless of whether we've betrayed him or whether we have uh, left him for a time. He just loves us anyway. And, and I think that is one of the... Um, I think it's it's amazing because that's what we need in a redeemer is someone who's always going to accept us. But as we've been asked to love other people as he loves us, that means that we have to adopt that same sort of love. And that's a very, very tall order. If you say, man, I don't think I could love someone who betrayed me. I don't blame you. And I have a hard time doing it myself. But the way I read John 13, 34 is that we are commanded to do that. We have to try to reach that. Um, because the Savior went so, through so many difficulties, he has developed great compassion for us. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that he's able to love us so well is because he knows what we're going through. And, um, and, and I, think that, I think that just creates compassion. He knows the backstory, basically. He knows the behind the scenes. He doesn't just see what we post on social media. He doesn't just see the, the smiling face in church. He knows all of it. And I think that enables him to have a little more uh, a depth of understanding and love for us. I have a quote here from uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts. He's the uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And he spoke at his son's high school graduation commencement. That's pretty cool, right? Hey, can my dad speak here? He's the <laughs> Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. This is what uh, Chief Justice Roberts said. Now the commencement speakers will typically also wish you good luck and extend good wishes to you. I will not do that and I'll tell you why. From time to time in the years to come, I hope, you'll be, I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope that you will be lonely from time to time so that you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time so that you will be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure. It is a way for you to under understand the importance of sportsmanship. I hope you'll be ignored so that you know the importance of listening to others. And I hope you will have just enough pain to learn compassion. Whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen. And whether you benefit from them or not, will depend on your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. Uh, it's been called, I wish you bad luck speech. And I love it because he's saying, I hope you have some of those negative experiences because they're going to teach you valuable things. That's what the Savior's atonement did as he suffered for all of our sins and suffered for all of our pains and our weaknesses. Um, it taught him about us. It helped, it helped him understand what we're like. And so I think that one of the things that we can do to increase our love for other people is to get to know them better, try to understand their situation. That person who just rubs you the wrong way and you can't stand him or her, I got news for you. There's probably a backstory, a very heartbreaking backstory to that person's situation. And the more you get to know about that, those feelings of um, frustration and annoyance will probably yield to compassion. Um, and and so we can do that by getting to know them. The other thing we can do is we can pray for it. 
Um, Mormon teaches how the gift of charity is a spiritual gift and we can pray for that. Now, if you pray for charity, the Lord is probably going to give you some opportunities to develop it. It's not just going to wave a magic wand over your head and the next morning you wake up charitable. It's going to give you chances to develop it, which are going to require effort on your part, which is awesome. That's what we need to do. Um, but that uh, loving people regardless of who they are, what they do is critical. The Savior told us to love our enemies and bless them that curse us, do good to people that hate us and pray for people that despitefully use us and persecute us. That's the type of love that we need to have all the time to everyone regardless, just like the Savior does. So wrapping up uh, the three things, number one, love first, meaning don't wait for the other person to make a move. You make the move first, express your affection, express your appreciation, um, your degree of, of connectedness with them. Um, make sure they know that. And, and um, when you make that overture first, that kind of uh, sets the ground for them to be able to do that as well. Uh, number two is to love often. Be frequent with your expressions of love and appreciation towards others, both in word and in deed. And number three, to love regardless, meaning we love everyone. And praying for that love that the Savior has, um, that true, that pure love of Christ, which is charity, and um, and then trying to learn about them, develop greater compassion by understanding people uh, more deeply before you judge them. I'm grateful to be able to talk about this tonight. Um, I love my Savior Jesus Christ. I know that he lives. I'm so thankful for his depth of compassion, uh, which came at a terrible price that he had to pay himself. But I'm thankful because he understands me completely. He understands you completely. And he will always, always, always be there for you, no matter what you've done. The only thing that's left to decide is how happy do you want to be? How much joy do you want to have in your life through obedience and through following his commandments? Because that's what happens when we do that. Thanks for listening. Um, and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That was awesome. Dr. Morgan, thank you so much. I just got to say, <laughs> I could, number one, I could listen to you forever because <laughs> you have this incredible way to boil down what for me previously has been very complex ideas. And, and you boil it down in a way that just allows me to digest it, digest it and understand it. And you are so talented at doing that. Thank you so much for what you shared today. I loved it. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate that. And I, um, it's, it's a blessing. I think uh, we all, I, I, sometimes I feel like we're all standing around the piano, like Elder Workdorf said, lifting where we stand. Yeah. And this is my job is to try to take some of these things and, and break it down into simple ways. So I appreciate that very much. Well, yeah. And before you go, I got to tell you, I just had a couple thoughts that I wanted to share with you. So yeah. Uh, with your love first, which was step number one, I wanted to uh, share with everybody the advice that our sealer gave us mm -hmm. when my wife and I were being sealed. And he said a lot of things that were extraordinary. I wish that I had it recorded. But the one idea that stuck out that I remembered this day was, this is what he said. He said, to this point, this love first point, he said, when you get home from work, he was telling me specifically, he said, eventually, you know, when you have kids and then you've got dogs and they're all going to, you know, want to see you and hug you first. He said, you go to your wife first and you let her know how much you love her. And I have always tried to do that. I'm not always perfect, especially because now my children are larger and they're harder to like swim past to get to my wife. But, but that I never forgot that, that her lips should be the first ones that I kiss her. Her um, hug should be the first one I give when I come home or when I return. Um, her eyes are the first eyes that I should meet. And there, I think there is um, wisdom in that beyond just the physical aspect of, of uh, you know, the touch and the kiss and, and obviously even the expression. I think that just the principle of, of her coming before the other things in my life that are also equally important and that I love in many ways that, that she's got to be number one. So I, I loved that sealer's advice and you reminded me of that today. So thank you for that. And I, and I gotta tell you, so one other thing, uh, you, you talked about, um, you know, loving often and, and saying it, and uh, I, it, you, you, you said something that I just think is so true. You said it's about the feeling. It's not necessarily just about the words, right? And 
<laughs> Here's how I know that that's true. I served my mission in Germany, okay? And I don't know how people in Germany can fall in love if it was just based on language. Because, you know, when we say, like, I love you, that sounds pretty good. You know, in Spanish, what is it? It's like, te amo, like it kind of rolls, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think French... French is like, je t'aime, you know, <laughs> even, even Mandarin Chinese, you know, it's what I need. It's like, it's all of these, it just kind of flows, right? And then to say it like the real German way, it's, ich hab dich lieb. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you're angry, you know, and you're, you're spitting venom at the other, but we're not, we're saying, I love you. So I think that there is, there's something profound in that. And I appreciate that you said too, um, that, that it, it, it's important that we say it often. I think that my wife and kids, they're probably like, can you stop telling us that you love us? Like you've already said it enough. And I'm, but you know what I think? And tell me what you think about this, Dr. Morgan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Tell me what you think about this. I think that at times our desire to express love and 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 the the ease with which we do it at times, I think can be a reflection of who we've become inside. And what I mean by that is we shouldn't be afraid. Like you said, there's many husbands that say something to the effect of, you know what, she should know that I love her. But I think of, I think of the, the parable of the 10 lepers. And I think about the 10th le leper who came back. I don't think that he just had the thought to say, thank you. I think he was a grateful person. He'd become someone that the, the expression of gratitude to the savior was just a natural thing for him. And I think for us, we need to develop it so that saying, I love you feels natural is there is there something to that or am i am i up at the night and just crazy no, no you're totally right and it's just i think that um well we're here to become like the savior right and and he is not withholding with his expressions of love we, we feel it all the time and sometimes we feel it profoundly and uh and so we need to get to that same point where we're kind of where people just know that we love them and that we care for them and that's only going to happen by saying it and expressing it um, the more you do it, the more it's going to happen. When President Nelson talks to us, even over a screen, and he says he loves you, you feel it. You're like, I know that man loves me. And if I was sitting right next to him, he'd give me a big old hug, and it would be the most sincere thing I've ever experienced in my life. And because he is a loving person. Uh, and my guess is that he's probably like the Claysons, and that the Nelsons probably heard it on and on and on again. With that saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Um, but, but there's no way, you know, you're not going to get better at playing soccer by watching it on television. You get better by playing, you get better at loving by doing it, you know, not by reading romance novels or, or watching rom-coms. You get better by saying it and by doing it. And so absolutely. So tell your family they're fortunate because they definitely don't want the opposite. They don't want the other end of that stick. Right. That's the end, you know, they no, just, that's, just, that's saying, I love you again. There are yeah. people around that would be thrilled that their dad told them they love them because they may have never heard it. So yeah, uh, good for you. Well, oh, thanks, Dr. Maureen. You are awesome, my friend. Thank you for what you shared. We're going to let you go backstage and we'll bring you back here after Gainalyn is done because I've got a couple like lightning round questions for you guys about Valentine's Day. And we've got Gainalyn with us. Hi, Gainalyn. How are you? I'm so happy to be with you, Kevin. It's a great way to celebrate Valentine's Day because you're oh, one of my favorite people. Well, you're one of mine, and I am so glad you had a wonderful birthday, and I'm so glad that you got to go to the Magical Kingdom um, because <laughs> it, that is one of my happy places yes. for sure, and I'm glad that you were able to have a good time with your family. It was fun to just watch your journey when you were um, when you were there, just watch it well, on I social. I tell you, Kevin, that um, you sent me that sweet Marco Polo from birthday message, which I was so grateful for. And my daughter was sitting in the back of our really fancy rental car that has no reflection on what we actually drive at home. <laughs> and she's like, wait, was that Brother Clayson? He was my favorite EFY teacher. I just kept going to his class over and over. And I'm like, uh, yeah, he's my buddy. And she's like, oh, I forgot that. Anyway, she had all these sweet things to say. And I said, well, you know what I love about Kevin is he is always celebrating other people. So I wanted to publicly tell everyone that you, you are the best. And, and, uh, and I loved what Dr. Morgan shared as well. And just the feeling of, of love and the inclusiveness of the messages that he shared and I want to share. So it doesn't matter what your relationship status is tonight. 
we really here at Onward want to make sure you feel loved. Yes. And thank you so much for saying that. I didn't know that your daughter came to my EFY classes. And she kept staying in your sessions. So because those were my favorite people, the ones that stayed because they made yeah. me feel like I wasn't, you know, a useless pile of words. And so I know, I tell your daughter, I love her back. That's awesome. I, I, had, I had the same experience when I presented at EFY. And so the kids that just kept getting in line and coming back, I was like, oh, I am not ruining it. It's, it is yeah. working. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm so excited to hear from you, Gaina Lynn. And so over to you. I always love to hear from you and I cannot wait to learn from your brilliance. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, welcome to this special Valentine's Fireside. I hope you already have felt the love that everyone on this panel is sharing with you. And I want to add to it. I think that the month of February is such a beautiful time to talk about our hearts and heart conditions. And those um, conversations have nothing to do with relationship status. We all have beating hearts and we all have hearts that need care. And we all have hearts that have scars that need healing, that have had loss. And so tonight I wanna share a message that maybe helps with healing so that you have a heart that can do the long view, can do the marathon run and that your heart, if it has some scars, that we can kind of bandage it up tonight so that as you go forward, you have the soft heart, the approachable heart, as Dr. Morgan talked about, where the, where the bridge can be lowered so that people can connect with you. That's an inside job that we get to each do. We can't control other people or what their hearts are saying or doing, but we do have the ability through our savior to control our hearts and what we do to nourish our hearts changes the world. So tonight I want to talk with you a little bit about certain heart conditions that I have seen and experienced myself. The first one is a heart condition that I literally have. I have a heart condition. I've talked publicly about my journey with lupus, but what a lot of people don't realize with lupus is that you can have organ involvement. So I currently have a lot of arthritis. I don't know if you can kind of see the twisting of my fingers that is really starting to happen. And sometimes you can see arthritis and sometimes you can't. For me, lupus has been most challenging on my heart. And I have a heart condition called pericarditis. And I have done multiple years of chemotherapy to treat that heart condition. You can have that heart condition without having lupus. But basically what it is, is the heart is like this, my fist, and there's a sac around the heart called the pericardium. Between the heart and the sac, sometimes there is fluid that develops, kind of like a blister. And when that happens, it's really painful. I've had multiple years where I have had chronic heart pain. I still have periodic heart pain, but, but when I have a flare up, so to speak, of my heart condition, it literally feels like I'm having a heart attack constantly. It doesn't go away and it's 24-7. And because I've had this heart condition where the fluid has come between the heart and the sac of the heart, I have scar tissue around my heart. So I have an area of my heart that often will, I'll have some sharp pain or I'll have some pain if, if, if my health is struggling during a period of time. I, every time I have that little ping in my heart, it's a reminder of the scars that I literally have around my heart. And it reminds me so much of my savior. So when I have that little ping in my heart, I think about my savior and I think about his, all of his love for us and his ability, as Dr. Morgan talked about, to sucker us. He knows us. He knows us. And so as he suffered and as he took upon himself our sorrows, he knows how to personally sucker us. If the savior was to come into your room right now, when you see him, first and foremost, I believe what he'll do is call you by name and he will, he will express his love. I believe he's a hugger like I am. And so immediately we'll have a hug and we won't be worrying about masks or pandemic. We'll hug and embrace. But I think eventually we may notice that he still carries the scars of his mortal experience on his hands, on his feet and on his side. 
scars that represent, instead of sorrow, I hope as you think about the Savior and you think about the garden and you think about the cross and you think about the scars that he carries, that you will see those as emblems of love. When we partake of the sacrament each week, I think it's such a beautiful opportunity to have a very intimate connection with Christ. He is there to enable us through his grace. And when we partake of the bread and the water, it is literally an internalization, an intimate connection of his body and his blood that enables us to go forward. I love to talk about stewardship assignments. One of the stewardship assignments I've been trusted with the, the stewardship assignment of my heart condition and my health condition is a stewardship assignment from God. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe you've been entrusted with the stewardship assignment of depression or anxiety or a learning disability or divorce. Maybe you've been entrusted with the, the stewardship assignment of infertility, or maybe you have been entrusted with the stewardship assignment right now of unemployment. Oftentimes we want the stewardship assignments that look fun and exciting. We want the stewardship assignment of wealth. We want the stewardship assignment of fame. We want the stewardship assignment of the nice car, the nice house, or our kids making the choices we want them to make. But what I've come to understand is God is trusting us all with stewardships, stewardships that we may enjoy and some that may be more challenging, but all of them, just like the parable of the talents, as we give them watch care and we take them to the Lord, he can consecrate our efforts and multiply our efforts. I've come to know through the stewardship assignment of health issues that this body is a gift. And for 50 years, my spirit has dwelled in this body, this temple, and it has struggled at times. I've gone through infertility. I've gone through some chronic illness issues. I've gone through anxiety and depression. I've gone through grief. I've gone, gone through chemotherapy treatments where my hair fell out. And what I will tell you is that those experiences have taught me to draw closer to Christ, to ask for his help, to consecrate my efforts. Each day when I try to find food that will help my body or get the exercise that I need, I try to pray beforehand that my effort will be consecrated. So my invitation for you is to consider the scars of your heart. Are those scars stewardship assignments? Are those scars ways in which you can draw close to Christ and see his love for you? Can you see his grace and where he has been able to touch your heart and help you through those hard times that may have left scars on your heart? And can you see those scars in a way that you can rejoice? I have a little scar. I don't know if you can see it with my ring light where it's at. There, It's a little dent right there. I was a little girl. As a little girl, I was running around the coffee table that my parents had, and I fell on the corner of the table. And I have an upside down T scar from hitting my head on that table and blood going everywhere. My mom took me to the doctor in the emergency room and blood was going everywhere. And eventually I had to have stitches. And I, for some reason, I love to tell the story. I don't remember the pain. I don't remember the blood. My mom does, but I don't. I just have this cool scar that I get to tell people the story about. I know that some of the scars on your heart are tender. They're not just uh, you, a scar that you can remember, but you don't remember the pain. Maybe you do remember the pain. I invite you to go to the Lord tonight and allow him to show you through those experiences, those stewardship assignments, how he has shown up for you in love. I invite you to have those scars be a reminder of his love for you as his scars are a reminder of love for us. Okay, the other condition of heart that I want to talk on and touch on is the healing heart. I have a beautiful daughter and a beautiful son. My son is 23 and my daughter is 17. They both just had birthdays in the last few months. And my daughter was born with a, an amazing spirit about her. The first moment that the doctors handed her to me, and, and the same thing happened with my son. I had seven years of infertility. When they handed me that baby boy, it was like my heart was healed from all those seven years of, of pain and struggle. And immediately I looked at my little boy. I had an emergency C-section and just said, oh, Cameron, I love you. I love you. Mama loves you. Mommy's here. And I tell the story. He stopped crying the moment he heard me say that. Six years later of, of trying again to have another baby, my daughter was born. 
And when they handed her to me, I looked at her and immediately I recognized her, like my spirit recognized her. And I said, oh, it's you. It was like this reunion with a long lost friend. And she is, she has been such a gift in my life as well as my son. But soon we found that she had a heart condition as well. This one um, is called a PFO and many people have them. And it's basically a hole in her heart and you could hear it. It made a very interesting sound. If you had the stethoscope up to her heart, you could hear this kind of whooshing sound where, where there was a hole in the heart. Um, as far as we know, no one can hear that sound anymore. She just had her well child checkup and there's been some healing there. She also has a very unique eye condition. If she was here, I would share it with you where her pupils are not round. She has what look like cat eyes and she can read in the dark. So if I turned off all the lights, she would be able to come in here and be able to see perfectly because she gets double the light. Her eye condition was pretty scary when when they told us that she had this, she was six weeks old and they thought she might be completely blind. Um, she did struggle with some focus and she had more light that would come into her eyes. So as a baby, we had a whole big collection of baby sunglasses because she would kind of squint when the sun was really, really bright, but she got used to it and her brain compensated for it. Well, right before she started kindergarten, we used to have to go to primary children's hospital to an eye specialist every few months to have her eyes checked. She wasn't completely blind, which was a miracle. And, and yet she did have some underlining issues with this eye condition. It's called bilateral, which is both sides, colobomas. So she has a coloboma in both eyes. And I had never seen her specialist smile before. He just, he just didn't have that kind of bedside manner, if you know what I mean. And um, she was now five. We had seen him every few months for five years. And when we would go to primary children's, if you've been to a children's hospital, it's a very humbling experience because you see so many children that have very severe body struggles. And it's such a humbling experience to see their spirits battle with these bodies that aren't perfect. Well, all of a sudden we go through all these tests, the same tests we've been doing since she was a six week old little baby every few months. And her doctor had never smiled. He's very uh, serious and he was very intelligent and he knew exactly about her heart condition. And he was an amazing doctor for that reason, but he wasn't a chit chatty person. And I'm a chit chatty person. Shocker. And he came in smiling and Brooklyn and I looked at each other. That's my daughter. And I thought, okay, what's going on? Why is he smiling? Well, he came back and he said, we've just tested her eyes and her, her vision is, is actually perfect. It's actually better than perfect. And Brooklyn and I looked at each other and said, what? Now, if you look at her eyes, you can still see that her pupils are not round, that they're shaped like a keyhole. But her vision had changed. Her healing had changed. One of the things I used to do when she was little, people would stop us at the store and they would notice her eyes and they would say, oh, oh, your eyes. And then they would stop and realize it didn't look the same as what they were used to seeing. And they would say, oh, they're so pretty. And I had always called them her magic eyes. When she was little, she didn't know how to say bilateral coloboma. Now she does. But I always talked to her about her magic eyes, that she could see more light in the world. Now on the outside, her eyes look the same. But what this eye doctor said was that she had healed. She actually had better vision than anyone else in the family. And that that was a miracle. Because really her condition is so rare and it should have affected all the way into her brain. And, and over five years, she actually experienced some healing, even though on the outside, it looked the same. It reminds me of a story in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, not the Old Testament, in the New Testament, where Jesus was walking along the road and he had an experience of personal healing with a woman with the issue of blood. If you're familiar with me on Onward Events, you know I've talked about the woman with the issue of blood in connection with my sister's suicide many times. But what people don't know always about that story, and I love to consider, is that because Jesus stopped on the road to heal this woman of her issue of blood, that she had waited for 13 years to have healing, where everything she had tried, she had gotten worse, and the hurt on her heart, as others experienced miracles, she didn't. Well, Jesus stopping and having this personal intimate exchange with her 
delayed him from another experience he was about to have. He had promised Jarius to go to his home where his young teenage daughter was dying and sick. And because Jesus paused to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation, because Jesus has time for all of us, right? He was late in arriving. When they arrived to Jairus' home, the people that had been attending Jairus' daughter came running out and said, you're too late. She's died. You can't give her a healing blessing. She's died. Now, everyone was obviously very upset and distraught about this because on the outside, it looked like it was over. Jesus was calm and said, she is not dead. She sleeps. And he rose her from the dead through his power and love. Friends, sometimes the miracle that we're waiting for, like the woman with the issue of blood, takes much longer than we think. Oftentimes, the miracle we're waiting for looks like it already passed us by. And it and we go from being really sick to dead, dead emotionally, dead spiritually, dead mentally, dead financially. Friends, I'm here to say to you that Christ has a miracle healing plan for you and for me. It may not happen in five years like it did for my daughter. It may not happen in 13 years like it did for the woman with the issue of blood. It may not happen when we want it to for our loved ones. But I promise you that it always is possible. Elder Holland has said that miracles come now or later, but they always come. And so I testify that your heart can be healed. You may still know from the outside that things look off or different or not the way you want, but I have come to understand the power of the atonement to heal my heart. Finally, I want to talk to you about the heart that has experienced loss. So I've talked about my sister Meg many times. It has now been almost seven years since her passing she died by suicide, but she is buried next to another sister of mine, my sister Bonnie. My sister Bonnie died when I was 10, and she was two. I don't talk about Bonnie as often. When she was born, she was born with a heart condition as well. She didn't have just a small hole in her heart like my daughter. She had two big holes in her heart where the ventricle and atriums had not, the vessels had not formed. And so when she was only a few hours old, a cardiac surgeon with massive, huge hands operated on her tiny little heart. And she came home to be with our family for about over a year until she could grow a little stronger. They couldn't fix her heart that first surgery. And she had just such an amazing, beautiful spirit about her, a light that filled our home with love. It raised the bar in our family. It taught us of what an angel could feel like. In her presence, we wanted to be better because she carried such a light. The veil was thin with her. She never grew strong enough to walk on her own, but she did get big enough to pull herself up on the side of a couch and walk along the edge of the couch and hold on to the couch. And after she had turned a year and grown a little stronger, she went back into the hospital to have what we hoped would be the surgery to fix her heart. They were able to repair her heart, but the surgery was so intense she went into a coma. She was in a coma for many weeks. And what I've been told about that experience, because she was in the NICU and we weren't able to go visit her during that time, my mom and dad spent a lot of time at the hospital and we were able to stay at relatives and neighbors' homes, my sister Meg and I, while they were at the hospital with her. But that the doctors and the nurses would come and take their breaks in her room because they said there was a glow, a light about her room, a peace that they didn't feel any other place. And so they would take their breaks on their shift in her room. And when she passed, it was a miraculous experience, not because she was saved and healed, but because at her funeral, rows in the state center were filled with these doctors and nurses that came to her funeral. My mom had books of Mormon made 
with engravings of the names of those doctors and nurses and were given to the staff as a thank you for the care they had given Bonnie. So in her very short life, under two years on earth, she was a missionary. My friends, sometimes our hearts carry loss. I think of Ruth and Naomi as they lost their husbands and their children. And as they grieved, they almost departed from one another. They didn't want to be together because they were in such grief. Instead, they stayed together. And it's one of the beautiful stories of the scriptures where these two women in their grief, in their loss, decided to keep pressing forward in connection. If you're a doctor, a nurse, in the health profession, and you're out there listening tonight, I hope you feel of our family's love and appreciation for the work you do. The connections that were made with our family when Bonnie was in the hospital became the gift of our grief. As Ruth and Naomi pressed forward, they got jobs, not great jobs, but they were cleaning up the field. And from that job, there was a marriage. And from that marriage, there was a baby born. And from that baby, another baby was born and so on and so on until Jesus came through that line. Friends, sometimes we think there's no way to heal from loss, but I believe heaven is cheering us on. They're comforting us. They're never leaving us alone. And they're trying to keep us in a place to receive greater miracles that are to come. So my invitation to your, to your heart tonight, whether it's trying to heal from scars and healing has happened for you or the loss is so real and raw that you can't see a way forward, I invite you to have the long view. Your heart is strong. This last week when I was in Florida celebrating my birthday, I was able to walk along the beach and I picked up shells and I picked up shells, one for every decade of my life. So five shells and some of the shells had holes in them. Some of the shells were perfectly shaped. And then I found a rock and I was going to bring it and share it with you, but it's upstairs. And so I forgot that, but it was, it, I'll share it on my Instagram account. How about that? A picture of this rock looks like a heart. And it has the engravings from the sea and the tide coming over this rock. It even has the little chambers it looks like on the rock of the heart. And it reminded me of all of the, the loss and struggle in the last 50 years of my life. The, the struggles with infertility, the struggles with Meg and her suicide, the struggles with job loss, the struggles with depression, the struggles with raising kids, the struggles and questions of my heart of regret of mistakes I've made and things I've had to repent of. All of that was on my mind. I get really reflective on my birthday. And when I held this rock, all of a sudden I saw the beauty of all of these little um, engravings and trails on the heart, uh, the rock that looked like, a, that made it look like a heart. And I thought about the tide coming in and out as the tide comes in, it brings in sometimes rock and, and, and driftwood. And then as it comes out, pulls out, it takes away and it brings in and takes away and brings in and takes away. And I believe that Christ is doing that in our lives. Sometimes we're losing things that don't serve us anymore. And, and we, we feel the gap, the hole from that loss. But sometimes it's that process of, of the ebb and flow, the seasons of our lives, the tides of our lives that we are changed and we become as Christ. I think of the uh, times that we must wait upon the Lord in patience. And I, I know that in the scriptures, we are told that all that we can offer God is our heart, our broken heart, our contrite heart, and our spirit. That's the offering we can have as a gift to God. And as we give that over willingly, he is working out our healing. Our scars are are evidence of his love for us. And the healing sometimes doesn't look like it from the outside, but I have come to experience healing that no one else can see. I feel it. I know I've been changed. I know that the losses in my life have helped me know more of God's love in my life and his power in my life and his ability. He is known as the great physician and he's the advocate with the father. 
And so I hope on this Valentine's, as you see hearts all over, here's this, this is one of my hearts that hangs in my office during Valentine's month, that you will see the engravings of God upon your heart and that you will know of his love for you, no matter what your relationship status is, he is mighty to heal and he is aware of you. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Wow. As always, mind blown. Um, you know what? I just, my gosh, I, I seriously could just listen to you for all of the time in the world. You, I don't know. I've heard you speak too many I times. Too how, many times. <laughs> so many times. And one of the things that I have incredible love and respect for when it comes to you is you never, I don't think I've ever heard you deliver the same message twice. And I know that's kind of how you roll, right? It's you and the spirit and a microphone. That's kind of what you do, but you always have this incredible context and this incredible life experience to add to whatever that message is that the Lord's inspired you to deliver. And, um, my gosh, I just, I literally, I marvel at you and, and I think many do. And I just wish everybody in the world could hear you speak all of the time. And I know, I know you are, there's so many ways to hear from Gaino Lynn. You are so busy and you do so much. And there are so many more people out there that need to hear your voice. And I am just thankful that you're willing to share it with us on firesides like this. We, I just feel so blessed to be in your presence. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I, I always feel of your love and support. And you and I have talked privately many times when my heart has felt heavy or my heart has felt discouraged or my heart has felt uh, caught in the trap of comparisons. And you're always so good to reinvigorate kind of like those um, little cardiac machines that you can pull off the wall. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you you are the, the little heart shocker sometimes that I need. And so thank oh. you for your kind words. Well, thank you so much. I got to, you know, gosh, you shared so many incredible things, but one of the things I, I appreciate so much a reframe. And, and what you said about our stewardship assignments, right? And and because so often we do, we think that these are things that somehow we're cursed with. But but when we just reframe that and realize this was a stewardship assignment, um, what can we learn and then go on to bless the world with based on those experiences and those difficulties? Um, what a beautiful way to put it. And I've been blessed um, with the stewardship of divorce. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I I was married for three and a half years. I've talked about it before in Onward Productions and um, did not know that that was going to be a part of my mortal experience. In fact, that's quite the opposite of what I thought would happen. But because of that stewardship, you know, there's a couple really critical things that I never, ever would have learned and that I never would have been able to share with others, either in formats like this or or almost more importantly, one-on-one -on -one sitting across from someone that's struggling or that needs some counsel, and I can share some thoughts with them. And one of the thoughts that that I learned through that experience, and as I've gone on to marry the love of my life, and we've been married 14 years now. Happy and, birthday um, to have, her, right? Did uh, she have a birthday this week? Yeah, Milana had her 40th birthday this week. And then um, my Brooklyn had her 12th birthday on Friday. And so we we busy week around here. Wow. <laughs> um, which Brooklyn, Brooklyn, I mean, how do you go wrong with that name? Um, right. right. I mean, you did the right thing there. Uh, but one of the things I've thought of so often is one of my favorite examples from the Book of Mormon of how to love and act in a relationship is uh, the anti Lehi Nephi's. And I think there's so often when we go into a relationship or we go into something where there maybe feels like there's, um, I don't know, a little bit of conflict. Uh, we have this, we do this thing where we get really defensive. And I think this is appropriate for Valentine's Day. We're talking about strengthening relationships, healing our hearts, as you so eloquently put. One of the phrases that always comes to mind that I wish I would have known as I was going through my divorce and that I hope I've learned since and I'm not perfect at, but I try to be really good at is when those moments come, we get to lay down our shields and weapons of war. Yes. 
we don't so often the shield comes up because we want to deflect what's coming to us um and 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 we we have our weapons of war ready right the cutting word or the well that's well remember when you did that you're criticizing me for this or whatever the case may be we have these shields we have these weapons of war we decide to be defensive and offensive but if we look at the anti lehi nephi's what did they do they buried those weapons of war deep in the ground. That includes those shields. They stood chest bared and said, okay, father, what am I to experience? And there's so many times when, you know, in marriage, we come up with those things and those moments. And maybe there's that little disagreement. I try to think all the time, if I can lay down my shields and weapons of war, how do I respond? And then if I do what um, what Dr. Morgan said, and I express that love, and that becomes the default that I love regardless, that I'm not loving because of conditions or, well, I would love you more, but you did that thing or said that thing. Um, that has helped me more than anything. And I was reminded of that when you talked about this stewardship that I've been given of divorce and what I learned through that. So I just wanted to share that with everybody because that's something that's been powerful for me. You know, I, I also have somewhat the stewardship of divorce because my parents were divorced and they were divorced. I mean, I'm 50. So, you know, uh, 45 years ago in the church, divorce was not common. And so I often went to primary and had people say, what do you mean your dad doesn't live with you? And so that, that experience has taught me a lot. And for the families of, of divorce, um, that are trying to navigate that and the children of divorce that are out there, I often say to couples that are going through that experience, that stewardship assignment, that, uh, remarriage is just more people to love your kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, my parents gratefully have navigated divorce in a really brilliant way. They've remained friends and they very much see each other as a brother and sister. That's not always the case when it comes to divorce, but they very much see themselves as a brother and sister in the gospel. And, um, they were better friends than married. And at my sister's funeral seven years ago, they sat at the end of the pew together. And then I was kind of in the middle and my stepdad, who's still married to my mom was on the other side of me. And that's just classic, our family. And, um, I'm grateful for that because I often tell people going through divorce, be very careful what you speak of your ex uh, spouse, um, because your children are half of that person. And when you speak ill of that other person, this is where my minor in psychology shows up. It's not what David Morgan has, but um, that you're shaming that child. Uh, uh, part of who I am is, you know, uh, I see from my dad and part of who I am, I see from my mom. And so they both were very careful to never speak ill of one another. We grew up and figured out exactly why there had been a divorce. No one had to really explain it. And there's ways to respectfully explain it. And so if there's families out there tonight that are navigating that process, um, I, I think there, as I tried to share in the message tonight, there's healing that is possible even when the scars are still there and, um, and divorce isn't fun. I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people that have been in really difficult marriages and they still say divorce was worse and they didn't want it, even though the marriage was horrible and needed to happen, you know? So I think for the marriages that are kind of in that middle zone, that middle earth zone where they feel like they're half dead, like nearly dead, like princess bride, I, I, I think Valentine's day can be a triggering time because maybe your marriage isn't where you want it to be. I too, Dr. Morgan was talking about 30 years. We celebrate our 30th, the 1st of June. And um, I, I love my husband more than I did 30 years ago. And we're not the same two people. You know, we are definitely, there are three in the marriage. It's the savior who has kept us going together. And uh, we're not the same people. And I often think if the Rob of 30 years ago met the Gainolin of today, would he even want to go out with me? I don't know. Uh, you know, and I think, and I think that so important to realize that healing is possible and marriages are hard and all the good stuff is the hard stuff, parenting missions and marriage, all the good stuff. Let me say it again, is the hard stuff. All the best stuff is the hard stuff. And for that, I'm grateful we have a savior. So there was my little soapbox for Valentine. <laughs> I love it. No, it's so, it's so awesome. Thank you so much, guys. This has been incredible. And before we go, before we kind of conclude and Gainalyn, I'm going to ask you to give us a closing prayer when we wrap okay, up. Okay. 
So I have a couple quick like lightning round kind of questions. Well, two of them are like lightning round questions for Valentine's Day. And then the third is like a love story question. Okay, okay. you'll see, you'll see what I mean in a second. So okay. I want to hear from both of you and I'll give my answer as well. So okay. here's the first question. Okay, and we're gonna we'll we'll go Gaina Lynn, uh, Dr. Morgan, and then I'll respond. Okay, first question: favorite Valentine's Day candy? Go Reese's peanut butter cup hearts. Bam. Yes, Dr. Morgan. Uh, C's candy. See, okay, so, so I I have to go with Gaina Lynn on this one. I like Reese's butter cups, but I got to tell you, the hearts. There's more peanut butter. It's right? just better. It's just I, like it's extra full scent on the peanut butter and the chocolate. Yes, fantastic, absolutely amazing. Okay, good. Second question: favorite rom com? Gain a Lynn. Oh, favorite rom com. Okay, this is probably my most favorite of all times, but I don't think it's considered a classic rom com. Okay. So I'm going to give you an option too if we get hate mail about the genre I picked. <laughs> okay. Okay. My favorite rom com of all times, but is technically a different genre is sense and sensibility. Does that yeah. count? Okay. I think that can count. Okay. It's a love Jane, story. It's Jane Austen. I think rom-coms tend to be more like, you know, modern ish. Mm -hmm. So as my second pick, I would probably have to say sleepless in Seattle. Okay. I got to real quick before you go, Dr. Moore, I got to tell you a story about sleepless in Seattle. So I remember when I was a kid, sleepless in Seattle. Um, it, I don't think, I don't remember how old I was when it came out. I feel like I was kid ish or teenager. I don't know, but it came out at the same time. Jurassic park came out and okay. No, here's the thing. I'd already seen Jurassic park and it was amazing. It was like the definitive movie going experience for me. We were visiting friends. I don't remember where we were and the friends, we were all going to go to the movie, right? Like my family and, and their family. And we go to the movie theater, Jurassic Park is sold out. So we all had to watch Sleepless in Seattle. And I was so bugged, seething in my like adolescence, like why do I have to watch this David movie? And so to this day, I can't say I've got love for Sleepless in Seattle because it, well, listen, it is good, but it took the place of Jurassic Park. And that was an issue for me that okay. I'm still dealing with. Dr. Morgan, I'll be calling you soon. Uh, maybe we can work through this. Please, please. A little Meg Ryan and a little Tom Hanks and a little yes. Ozzy O'Donnell. I know it's it's all good stuff. Okay. I get it, but you know, okay. okay. Dr. Morgan, favorite okay. rom com. So, uh, so I got to uh, take from Ganolin here too and talk about kind of non traditional versus traditional. So, kind of, it's not so much a romantic comedy. It's a it's a love story. It's very non traditional, and you're going to say, "What in the world are you talking about?" But it's Christopher Nolan's Interstellar. Um, which if you know that movie, but because the, there's just so much in there about like like him and the love he has for his daughter and how they communicate, you know, through gravity and that sort of thing. And then at the end, how he meets her when she's old and then he goes off to find uh, Dr. Brand. And I just love the the depth of emotion of that. And I love it. We might have to rewatch that, Dr. Yeah. Morgan. That's a good, that would probably win me points with my husband if I said, let's watch a romantic movie. Interstellar. Interstellar. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. I uh, love that movie. Good. Oh, okay. So oh, that's your non-traditional. What's one, your traditional? My, a traditional one, I would have to say Princess Bride, which I know we already talked about, but I just love the, um, yes. the, the, the story of my year. A little mileage. A little mileage. When, well, so quick story. Um, back at, and when I was at BYU, they used to have midnight movies at the Dollar Theater. And so we would go and it would start at midnight, but they let us in at 11.30. And so we'd all be sitting there with nothing to do. So the people that ran the theater would get up no, and like, no, no, one had no, no one had cell phones to sit on their phone. No, no, no had cell phones. So, so they'd get up there and sing primary songs or that sort <laughs> of thing. Well, my friends and I decided that we were going to do skits themed to the movie at the beginning of each show. And so we just kind of commandeered the stage. So Princess Bride was one of the ones. And so I went to Kristen, who was just a friend at that point, not my fiance or my wife. And I said, hey, let's pretend that we're gonna get engaged and I'll bring you up on the stage and I'll propose to you. And then you'll say yes and we'll hug and everything. And then, and then we'll go sit down and then someone will say, hey, why don't they just get married right now? And then we'll go back up on stage and then someone will do the marriage scene and we'll get married. So we did that. And, um, and so then we went and sat down and I was grateful to her. And then 
the, the theater in charge guy came out and he said, hey, did they kiss? And everyone's like, no. And I'm like, well, of course I didn't kiss her. I, she's just a friend, right? So we go back up on stage and our first kiss was in front of 300 people. Yay! Of the little theater at the, in the Wilkinson Center. So that's my Princess Bride story. Oh that's my gosh, I story. love it that's so story. much. Okay, favorite rom-com. My wife always makes fun of me for this one, but it's like one of my top five favorite movies, period. Um, Clueless. <laughs> Oh, I love Clueless. You guys, I had the big, I had the biggest crush on Alicia Silverstone when I was in high school and I met her and I've got a picture with her and oh. and yes, and I I very I totally flirted with her and she flirted back and it was amazing, okay? And I got to tell you, so like I love Clueless and yeah, I'm she's like, an actress, right, Kevin? What's that? Well, she's an actress, right? <laughs> so the flirting back. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's that's right. I know that's what you thought, and and maybe it was, but you know she's pretty good at what she does too. Hey, although I will say I was like you know probably forty pounds lighter and had hair, so there was a shot. You know what I mean? There's a yeah. shot. My favorite line is, "Excuse me, Miss Dion." Okay, but oh, now I'm forgetting it. Oh my gosh! Of course, when I try to like give it, you know. Well, I um, forgot all my. Okay, but street slang is an increasingly valid form of expression. Some of the feminine no nouns do have mocking, but not necessarily misogynistic undertone. <laughs> you remember that line? That's my favorite Yay! line. It's been a minute. Okay, so I that's my favorite rom-com. I okay. love it. I love it. Okay, all right, now last I question. Think he's hurting from smiling. That's a good thing. <laughs> good. Okay, last question. Okay. I want to hear. So. Dr. Morgan, you kind of already did this, but I'm going to I'm going to take it one step further cuz I want to hear everybody loves a good engagement story. I want to hear Gaina Lynn, how did you get engaged? Dr. Morgan, how did you get engaged? And then I'm going to share how I got engaged. Okay, you guys, this is a really dangerous story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> like it's so like I was going to talk about Rachel and Jacob in my talk and then it felt like I needed to eliminate it. It, it, it's got some undertones of Rachel, Jacob and Leah. It's a little, <laughs> it's okay. Let me just say this. Or Leah. The people involved in this story are, are all happily married, but okay. <laughs> it's a little drama. Okay. So I go to Rick's college formerly known as, because now it's BYU-Idaho. I am a California girl living in the coldest place in my mind on planet Earth. And you can't even buy a winter coat where I grew up. And so I have these little like flats that I'm wearing and I'm sliding all over the ice and my nose hairs are freezing and, you know. And I left a boyfriend back at home, my high school sweetheart. And my now husband was, okay, I'm embarrassed to tell the story, but we, he had roommates and one of his roommates looked especially handsome on the first Sunday at church and was wearing this nice blue blazer with this red tie and the khaki pants. Do you remember the look I'm talking about? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And the bishopric was doing family home evening group assignments. And so they were visiting all the apartments and putting groups together of the female apartments with the male apartments, that kind of thing. My husband who I tell the story and people go, what? So very shy and me, never a shy part of my soul ever since the day I took a breath. Like I, I talk to strangers at age one. So it's not like I've ever been shy and he's newly home from his mission, nervous as heck, shy, shy, shy. And the bishopric comes to our house and I'm like, I want to be in that family home evening group because of so-and-so. Now, the man I'm talking about that had the nice tie and, and blazer was not my husband. It was his roommate. So our apartments got connected. Well, listen, I have the weirdest name on the entire planet. No one can say it. And it almost ruined my eternal companionship. This is what I'm saying. Because they put us together. And I guess my husband already had a crush on me, not knowing about my boyfriend back at home. I was supposed to be off at college dating, blah, blah, blah. But my heart was still in California, you know. And um, we he's in charge of our first family home evening event. And he decides to do homemade smoothies and doesn't have a blender. And excuse to ask me, he asked for my blender. Well, he decides he wants to ask me on a date. He just poked his head into the office because he knows I'm telling that story. This is a really long story, but I, this is the edited version. So listen, he 
keeps my blender for three, almost two months because he, he's trying to figure out a creative way to ask me out, but he can't remember how to say my name. <laughs> I... Say my name. So he doesn't ask me out. In the meantime, he finds out that I have a boyfriend back at home. And so he kind of gives up. He finally returns the blender. I don't find this out till the next year. And he asks out my roommate instead who starts dating him. So he becomes just my buddy and he's around the house all the time. He's at the apartment. He's the guy who gives us priesthood blessings when we're sick. He's, he had a car, so he would take us on errands. He was our protector. He sang in barbershop quartet. He sang an acapella choir and he was quiet and shy. And just like, I never tried to impress him. He was my roommate's boyfriend. I didn't know he had a thing for me originally. So I act crazy in front of him all the time. And we are death definitely in the friend zone for like a year. Long story short that I don't wanna tell all the details, but the deets are this. Second year at college, I'm roommates with who he's been dating and one other girl from our first year. My boyfriend and I, he has now joined the church and we have decided to break up because we either need to get married or he needs to go on a mission. In the meantime, he and Rob, my husband and my roommate break up because her missionary is coming home. This is the only thing that happens drama. Like before the real housewives of Salt Lake city, there was really the real house, the real students of Rick's college. And long story short, he's on the phone one day. I happened to go to his apartment where my boyfriend lives, who, who we're broke up with. And he's talking to his best friend in Canada. And you know how you're in college and you're just like, Hey, and my aunt wants to say, Hey to you. And I don't, I talk to strangers all the time. It's my jam. So he's like, Hey, my friend who I don't know wants to say, Hey to you. And I'm like, okay, Hey. And he's like, Hey, I'm Darren. I'm, I'm Rob's buddy in Canada. And I'm like, hey, Rob's sitting right there. My ex-boyfriend's in the back bedroom. And he goes, so, hey, Rob's into you. And yes, Rob's into you. And I think you guys are going to get married. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, my face turns like brighter, brighter red than it is right now. And I was like, what? Now it's one of those moments, all joking aside, my patriarchal blessing, full disclosure said, I would know who I was to marry and the Lord would play a part and not to worry about it. In that moment, you guys, this is how quickly the spirit speaks in that moment. The spirit said, you will marry him. And I was like, what? He's my buddy. He's the guy that I literally never had make a bond when he was around. And by the way, acted crazy grumpy all the time. And like, not my best, not my best self. And the spirit was like, okay. And I said, huh, I feel the same way, but this is what I'm saying to total stranger. He goes, oh, you're worried about your roommates. I'm like, uh, yeah. He's like, oh no, that's not a problem. You guys, we were engaged within a month. That is awesome. 30 year, 31 years ago. And I, I tell that story in, that's the edited version. So if you ever want the full unedited director's cut, there's some other juicy details that are not necessary for a fireside. But what I will say is this, marry your best friend. Because our friendship and that year of friendship that we had as a foundation has carried us through the hardest times. Our covenants have kept us when we have kept our covenants and I'm grateful I married my best friend. I, I just, I'm great. And by the way, the first couple of years of marriage are tough. No one tells you that. And when I would get crazy and trigger him and he would do stuff that triggered me, I would remind him that he had a full year of preview of my craziness. So he needed to not act surprised. I love it. <laughs> That's that, story. That's that is story. awesome. Okay, so Gandalin, we need to go to dinner uh, with the spouses, <laughs> and I want to hear the full story. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, there's some juicies that are not necessary, and we're short on time. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I love it, David Morgan. So, uh, like I told you, the uh, my first kiss with Kristen was on the stage of the little theater at BYU and the Wilkinson Center. So was my second kiss, as a matter of fact. Um, this was the, uh, so now we had really got into the spirit of doing these uh, skits before the midnight movies and Indiana Jones and the last crusade was playing. And Kristen is a huge Harrison Ford fan. So I told her, I said, Hey, 
can I take you to the movies? And we, we were dating at that point uh, pretty much. Uh, we both had a, a pretty solid interest in each other. And so I said, hey, I'll, I'll pick you up at, in the lobby of the Beck and Deseret Towers, which are now um, reduced to rubble, uh, but uh, where New Heritage sits. But I said, I'll pick you up at uh, whatever, eight o'clock. So she gets down there at eight o'clock and there's just a note there from me that says, hey, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it on our date. Um, something happened, but I've sent someone in my stead. So then I show up dressed up like Indiana Jones, um, <laughs> telling her that I'm, I'm gonna be your date for that evening. And so I had arranged with some friends all over campus, uh, like things we could find and puzzles we could do and stuff like that. So we went on all over campus to collect these different items. And it culminates ending up at the movies um, where in order to get the Holy Grail, she has to give me the kiss of death. And so, and so again, up on stage. So the first kiss was unplanned, second kiss, definitely planned, definitely manipulated. And she obliged and, uh, and kissed me again. And then, and we were probably, um, it was a couple months after that. Oh, but talk about knowing. So one night I'm walking home from the Wilkinson Center to Deseret Towers. And if you're familiar with BYU campus, there's the um, Harris Fine Arts Center right there. So I'm in between the Wilkinson Center and Harris Fine Arts. And I'm just walking home and I'm thinking in my mind about Kristen, just kind of obsessed, you know, in my thoughts about her, as people are when they're pondering marriage. And, um, and it came to my mind that I said, she's so choice. And I thought, well, that's kind of a weird, I, I would have, this was, you know, in the early nineties, I would have said rad or, you know, <laughs> cool or bodacious or something like that. Right. Uh, but not choice. And as soon as I said that in my mind, uh, the spirit said, where have you heard that before? And it's in my patriarchal blessing. Mm. And I said that the Lord would direct me oh. to choice daughters who would become my wife. And that's when I knew in fact, a few years ago, we were at BYU and I took a picture right at that spot. I'm like, this is the spot where I knew I was to marry Kristen. And a few weeks later, we were engaged and it'll be 30 years this fall. So oh. I love when the spirit tingles this side of my head when you were just telling that part. I love the spirit witnessing that the spirit was there for all of that too, Dr. Morgan. That's well, it, it was. I, I'm, it was the right thing. Yeah. That's oh, that's great. awesome. Well, thank you guys. What a great lightning round. You guys are awesome. Like Thanks, amazing Kevin. stories. Kate, thank you everybody for joining us. We are so thankful that you've been here tonight and uh, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I just want to add my testimony to these two incredible individuals that I know that Christ lives. And I know that if we will choose love and if we will choose it again and again and again, and if we will choose to realize that not only does the Lord love, love us, but that we can love him, that he loved us first. If we can remember to love often and to love first and to love regardless, if we can understand that we've got these stewardships and that we may have some scar tissue, but that there's healing that can come and that there's so much love available to you and I inside our relationships, both with one another, with our the most important people in our lives, and of course, with our Father in heaven. I bear witness that if we will focus on that love first, we will find unbelievable joy and fulfillment. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Gaina Lynn is going to take us home with a closing prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this evening, for this opportunity to celebrate our hearts and love and connection in our Savior. Heavenly Father, we ask that this message will go out and find those that are in need of healing and hope that they will have a renewed sense of opening up their hearts for a greater connection and love with those around them. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.